to share my screen. Okay, great. Everyone, can you nod if you can see my screen? Yep, okay. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, I lead the library's Office of Scholarly Communication Services. Uh, we help scholars navigate publishing, intellectual property, and information policy in research, scholarship, and instruction. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Tim Vollmer, our scholarly communication and copyright librarian. Wave, Tim. <laughs> um, Tim and I would love to learn a little more about the dissertation topics that you're working on, uh, since it will help us with examples and prepare us for some of your questions later. So, um, and, and it's also possible that maybe many of you don't know each other and it's a great way to share a bit about yourself. So if you feel comfortable doing so, um, we encourage you to tell us a little bit about your research in the chat as we prepare to get started today. Um, as you are sharing your research topics in chat, I will remind everyone uh, that today's workshop is the first of our fall publishing series to help early career researchers and authors uh, professionalize your scholarship. Today we're covering copyright in your dissertation. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, we'll be covering managing and maximizing your scholarly impact. Um, tomorrow's workshop is also going to provide you with practical strategies and tips for promoting your scholarship, uh, increasing your citations, and monitoring your success. On Thursday, October 22nd, you'll hear from a panel of experts, uh, an acquisitions editor, a first-time book author, and an author's rights expert about the process of turning your dissertation into a book. Um, we then take a break for a few weeks and come back with copyright and fair use for digital projects on November 10th and sharing and publishing data on December 1st. If you want to register for any of these workshops, please visit our website, lib.berkeley.edu slash scholarly dash communication. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, I think it's important to start off with a little bit of framing the issues for your dissertation, since we all have different understandings of what we need to think about and why when it comes to copyright and authorship. Framing is also an opportunity to either remind you about or introduce you to UC Berkeley's graduate division policies. Um, under grad division's policy, when you submit your dissertation, it will be published online both in ProQuest's dissertations database and in eScholarship, the institutional repository for the University of California. You can read more at this link about grad division's policies on requesting embargoes for limited periods of time, um, embargoes delay the publication of your dissertation online if you'd like. And you can also read more about the copyright and other questions you need to think about before you click submit. And what we're gonna be talking about today is how to help you navigate all of those copyright and other matters referenced in graduate division's policies. Okay, sorry about that. Um, one of the first things we hope you'll understand after today is that if you are including excerpts or images or other forms um, of other people's content, yes, you may need to consider their rights, but you also have rights as an author of what you're creating, both under US copyright law and the UC system wide policy, you hold copyright to your dissertation. So you want to think about how to manage your copyright. For example, should you register it? Do you want to license certain uses to others, etc.? In addition, um, by UC Berkeley graduate division policy, your dissertation will be made open access to the public. So you'll also want to make sure you understand how your rights play out in the various online spaces where your work will be made available. At the end of today's session, we will help you think about these rights that you yourself have as an author. For most of this workshop, we're going to help you think about what you're using of other people's content. And I wanna orient you to that bit first. This workshop's going to help you understand the difference between using this diagram for which you don't need permission, because as we'll learn today, this diagram isn't protected by copyright and the next situation, 
which is a diagram that that's protected by copyright and for which you would need to make a decision before publishing it about whether your use fits into an exception to copyright law or whether you need to get permission to use it. For those of you who are humanists, maybe you're using other people's text rather than diagrams. Today, we're gonna to help you understand the difference between the text on the left, which is in the public domain, and for which you don't need permission to include it because it's so old that it's not protected by copyright anymore and that on the right, which is a modern translation of that text. We'll learn today why there is a copyright in the new translation of that text. And the answer is because it's a derivative work. So the translation on the right is protected by copyright and you would need to make a determination of whether your use falls into an exception or whether you need permission to use it. We're also going to talk about what it means to get permission and when permission is already applied via a license. So that modern translation we just looked at on the previous slide is already licensed for us to be able to use in our dissertations. Meaning even though it's protected by copyright, we don't have to worry about whether or not we fit into an exception because the rights holder has already told us we can make use of the text in the way that we want to. At the most basic level, this framing requires us to understand that simply attributing the author does not mean that we have the right to publish or distribute their content to others. Attribution is something we do as a matter of scholarly and professional practice, but whether we can actually distribute or include content to begin with is instead based on whether we hold the copyright, and if not, whether we have some form of permission, either because the law says we do, or because the person who does hold copyright has granted us that gift in the form of a license. So how will you be able to sort through all of these questions? We're gonna go over an easy to apply workflow covering not just copyright, but other rights issues you'll face. But probably the most important thing is to know that we're here for you and we're happy to help. So if anything we do today triggers a question in your mind about something you're working on, you can always make arrangements to talk to us about it for, for more. Thanks, Rachel. So to get started with all these, um, we have to understand, you know, what actually is copyright. And at its core, copyright is pretty simple. So Congress created a collection of statutes to put into play a provision of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. That provision in the Constitution authorized Congress to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And they need science broadly here to include all sorts of scientific, scholarly, and creative endeavors. So basically, the drafters of the Constitution wanted to develop an incentive for artists to create things. So we as a society all benefit if people can build on the discoveries that came before them. So Congress was authorized to give artists some protection in their creations. And the way they did this was to grant exclusive rights to control the fruits of the author's creativity. These exclusive rights operate as an incentive to create things in the first place. But Congress knew they shouldn't give artists those rights indefinitely because protection that lasts forever would actually cut against reuse and building on the works that came before. And this would actually hamper the progress of science and the arts. So it's important to be aware of the origins of copyright because we sometimes tend to think of it as a blocker for creative expression and scholarship when actually it's designed to do the opposite. Next slide. So let's take a look at what these exclusive rights actually are. So the Copyright Act defines five exclusive rights. Uh, so what does that mean? Let's say I'm the creator of this photograph. So as the creator, I have the right to reproduction, which says that I'm the only one that can make copies of the photo. Uh, I have the right to create derivative works, which means I can adapt the photo into another format, such as edit it and use it in a movie poster. I have the right of distribution, which means I can pass out copies of the photograph. I have the public performance right. So here, perform me, the photograph in some way that, you know, and charge admission. 
You can see this doesn't really work with photos, but you can imagine what it would look like if this were a book or a script and I wanted to adapt it into a screenplay. And then finally, the public display right, which means I have the right to put it on display in a public space. And the copyright holder holds these rights exclusively, which means no one else can do any of these five things. Next slide. Notice what isn't a protected exclusive right, directing someone to a lawfully distributed or displayed copy. So you're not invoking any of the exclusive rights by providing links to lawfully uploaded content. That's why you never even have to worry that you're infringing copyright if what you're doing is linking to a lawfully posted or distributed version of a work. Next slide. Okay, we said the carrot and stick balance with copyright is that the exclusive rights are granted only for a limited period of time in order to incentivize the creation of more works. So the duration of copyright can vary but in the United States, it's typically at least the life of the author plus an additional 70 years. What does this mean? It means that within this protected period, you need the copyright owner's permission to exercise any of those five exclusive rights that we just talked about. Next slide. So to recap what we've gone over, copyright is meant to encourage both the creation and use of creative works and it gives authors exclusive rights to their creativity for a limited period of time. Now, you might be thinking right now, but that limited period of time of at least 70 years after an author dies is really long. And since this is the case, how is anyone supposed to be able to use anything if the copyright term lasts so long? Next slide. Well, first of all, there are some crucial limitations on what copyright actually covers. This is important because not everything that authors create is subject to protection under the Copyright Act. First, copyright only protects expression. It doesn't protect ideas or facts. You can't copyright a fact, a statistic, or a method. Now, obviously, you should still be citing your sources if you're doing something like using a statistic because you need to conform to the best practices for scholarship. But the point is you don't need to ask permission to use it. For example, here is the World Bank and OECD data on gross domestic product growth. There is nothing about this graph or the underlying data that is protectable by copyright. Data are facts and a line graph has no original expression. There are only so many ways you can show GDP growth as a function of time. The fact that the World Bank tries to apply a license to it you can see the Creative Commons license indication in the upper left hand of this image is most likely inappropriate because there's nothing that this ex that is expressive about this and thus there's no copyright. So there's nothing to license. Likely the reason the World Bank put a license on it is because they don't fully understand copyright or they just want to make sure you cite the World Bank. But as we know, uh, attribution has nothing to do with whether someone needs permission to use a work. Next slide. Let's take a look at something that might seem a little bit more difficult to parse. So here's a map of where groundwater exists within a pyramid in Egypt. This seems more expressive than just facts or data, right? But really it's not. The author might think this is protectable by copyright and that's arguable, but you could also observe they've done nothing here but draw lines and map locations with very basic numerals symbols and other nomenclature. So you really shouldn't need anyone's permission to make use of this map within your scholarship. And you certainly don't need permission to use the underlying factual information. Next slide. There's another category of work that isn't protected by copyright and that is work that's in the public domain. So if something is in the public domain, it is also available for use with no permission required. But we need to be careful here. Just because something is online doesn't necessarily mean it's in the public domain. There are instead two types of works that are in the public domain. First, US government works are in the public domain because they're not eligible for copyright protection. This means that you can use something like a federal government publication without having to get permission to use it. 
Now, of course, you should still cite your sources as we've discussed. Public domain for US government works only applies to materials created by the federal government and state government and foreign government works have different rules. The second category of works in the public domain is works that originally were protected by copyright, but where the copyright has expired. Take the example of Shakespeare. So Shakespeare's plays were written so long ago that copyright has expired. This means that if I wanted to rewrite Romeo and Juliet with a completely different ending, I could do this and I wouldn't have to get permission from anyone to do so. I would be perfectly entitled to do this because the underlying work is in the public domain and I can make any derivative work that I want. But say someone else took Romeo and Juliet and annotated it. I wouldn't be able to use their new edition with, without permission from them because their annotations receive copyright. It's just the original text that's in the public domain. Right now for works published in the US, everything published prior to 1925 is in the public domain. And for more recent works, copyright will expire 70 years after the death of the author, as we've talked about. So Tim helped us understand what is protected by copyright and what isn't. And we've said that if something is protected by copyright, then the copyright owner has those exclusive rights for a long time. That means if we wanna exercise one of those exclusive rights like reproduce materials for class or distribute them um, in our dissertation, we need the copyright holder's permission, except, except we don't need the copyright owner's permission if our intended use of the copyright protected work falls into an exception like fair use. So let's understand fair use. Fair use is an exception built into the Copyright Act that Congress included specifically to help encourage, protect criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, or research. Sounds a little bit like your dissertations. Um, Congress wanted to encourage this type of idea exchange. So they built in section 107 of the Copyright Act which provides that the fair use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is not an infringement of copyright. Great. So making a fair use for those stated laudatory scholarly purposes is not a copyright infringement. But how do we determine whether our use qualifies as fair use? For this, Congress set forth four factors that a court can balance in determining whether a use is fair. Now, you're not going to know whether or not you balance these factors correctly until a court agrees or disagrees with you. But let's explore these four factors in, in the context of using this photograph in your dissertation. Factor one looks at the purpose and character of the intended use. Nonprofit educational uses are more likely fair than commercial uses. But really what a court will increasingly look to is whether the use is transformative. Are you planning on using the work in a different way or for a different purpose than the original creator? Or alternatively, is your scholarship adding new insights or understandings to the work? Well, in this case, the photograph was likely taken to evoke a certain mood or make a certain artistic statement. If you use the photo to closely analyze and discuss it, you've transformed it from evoking a feeling to adding new insights or understandings. Combined with the fact that you're making a nonprofit educational use, factor one leans in our favor here. Factor two addresses the nature of the copyrighted work. Here, a, a use is more likely to be fair if you're using a factual or scholarly work rather than a more creative work. But courts hate dealing with this factor because they don't wanna be in the business of determining how artistic or creative a work is. So factor two is not usually very consequential. But in any case, factor two leans against us here because this is in fact a creative work. But remember, fair use is a balancing test. Any one factor weighing against us is not dispositive of overall fairness. So we turn to factor three, which explores how much of the original are you using? 
And how important is that portion to the overall work? Now, despite what you may have heard anecdotally, there's no set percentage that it's okay to use. I'll say that again, because it, it, it's surprising to people. There is no set amount or percentage that is okay to to use, nor is there a set amount or percentage that's too much to use. You could only you, you could use only a small portion of something, but if it's the most crucial portion and not closely tied to what you're doing, it might weigh against fair use. In other cases, you may need to use the entire thing and that won't weigh against fair use. What's important instead is using an amount of the work that is narrowly tailored to your new purpose. In our case here, we may need to use the entire photo to describe and analyze what we're trying to glean. So the entire photo may very well be narrowly tailored to our purpose, thus making factor three at worst neutral for us. Finally, factor four looks at whether your use would supplant the market for sales or licensing of the original. In other words, would somebody in your shoes otherwise purchase or license the work if they needed it? If there is no ready licensing market for this particular photograph and we're just using a low res photo that isn't going to supplant licenses of a high quality original anyway, in other words, someone would still need to license from the rights holder if they wanted a nice version of this photo, then we're not supplanting the market for the original. So factor four weighs in our favor. So overall, to recap, we're strong on factor one, which was transformativeness and the nonprofit educational purpose, and factor four, which is not supplanting the market. And we're fairly strong on factor three, because our use is tailored, the amount we're using is tailored to the purpose that we need it. Our use of this photo for the purpose of real discussion and analysis in our dissertation will likely be a fair use on balance. But you can see the difference in what the result would be if we weren't really going to discuss or transform the understanding much under factor one. The more we transform, the stronger factor one is for us and the stronger our fair use argument is. It's always going to be a balancing test. There's no bright line and no formula you can apply except taking a look at these four factors. And keep in mind that these four factors and the entire fair use exception is purposefully broad and flexible to promote academic freedom, expression, education, and debate. So we've just, believe it or not, gone over just about everything you need to know about copyright law to move forward with your dissertation. Now it's time to see how to methodically answer questions as you proceed with writing and publishing. As we mentioned, you're an author, so you also have your own rights. Part four of the workflow is going to address how to deal with those two. Lastly, we said this was a workshop on copyright, but we snuck a few other things in here too. There are a few other non-copyright legal issues you need to think about. You'll see, let's get going. And by the way, you can download this workflow from our website. So we'll start with step one. In the first step, all we're trying to do is determine whether or not we need someone's permission to use other people's content. That means we ask three things. One, is it protected by copyright? You now know how to answer that. We know what copyright does and does not protect, and we know for how long it protects things. Two, we look at if it is protected by copyright, then has a license already been granted? If a license has been granted, we don't need permission. Three, Okay, if it's protected by copyright and we don't currently have a license, do we instead fit into some exception like fair use? If we do, we don't need permission and we can skip step two and proceed to step three. So we're gonna test this out a little bit. Remember, step one is figuring out, do we need permission? The first thing we ask ourselves on do we need permission is, is it protected by copyright? Let's say in our dissertation, we are discussing Van Gogh's irises, which were painted in 1890. Take a, a, a gander, if you will, in the chat about whether or not you think this painting is protected by copyright. Great. So you see that someone completely nailed it. These, this painting's from 1890. 
it's in the public domain. What if I told you this was a scan made by the Getty Museum and they made that scan in 2005? Now I'll take a, a, a gander in the chat window about whether you think Getty would have copyright in the 2005 exact duplication. Someone can be bold here, we'll, we'll support you. Jeopardy Music, yeah. Okay, so we're not sure, right? Someone thinks that it, um, a 2005 reproduction would, would be in the public domain and some, someone thinks that it would still be protected by copyright. The answer is that Remember that copyright protects original expression. There is no original expression in an exact duplication or digitization of a public domain work, even if you invest effort or money in making the duplication. Now, you can control other people's ability to use the image or scan that you made if you want to recover your investment or just because you're mean and you want to control what other people can do with it. Um, but that's not through copyright, that's through contract. And it's merely because you made the digital opt object, not because you hold the intellectual property in it. So contrast this situation of an exact replica with a 2012 translation of a public domain work we looked at earlier. Remember that, that uh, Italian poem. In a modern translation of a public domain poem, you are creating new original expression. And so there is copyright in the new translation even if the original poem is in the public domain. Unfortunately, we see this issue of museums or um, publishers trying to claim copyright in public domain work through their exact reproductions of public domain work all the time. And it was just on Twitter this past week. Um, you may be familiar with the how it started meme. Um, someone specifically made one about the co-opting of the public domain in which a publisher is claiming that its replica of Van Eyck is protected by copyright. Sometimes publishers or, or cultural heritage institutions simply don't understand that you cannot restore copyright in an exact replica of the original, but they put copyright watermarks on it anyway. Now, if someone who has taken time to digitize the image wants to, to use um, and control the use of that digital copy, again, that's on a contract basis, not on a copyright basis. So you can be aware of this and push back. All right, the second thing we ask ourselves in step one is, if it is protected by copyright, is there already a license? So take a moment to indicate in chat whether or not you think we need to get permission to use this heart diagram. Exactly. The answer is no, we don't need permission because the creator here already gave us permission by putting a Creative Commons license on it that allows us to make a, the use of it in the way that we want to. Okay. What if, though, we had answered in step one of do we need permission, it is protected by copyright, and there isn't a license already? Well, then we have to figure out whether an exception like fair use applies. So imagine here we're analyzing Cervantes's work, and we're excerpting this paragraph from a 2011 translation of Don Quixote. Do we need the permission of the copyright owner? In this case, it's either the publisher or the oh, translator from 2011. Indicate in chat what you think about whether or not this is fair use and why. Anyone else have thoughts on this one? Ariel's nailing it because in this case, there's no doubt in my mind that including a paragraph from a 2011 translation is fair use. And I'm sure that she remembered the four factors. First, what's the nature and purpose for which we're using this? A dissertation is nonprofit educational. And as Ariel mentioned, we're transforming it by adding new insights or understandings to it 
provided we directly analyze this, this particular segment. The second factor is the nature of the work. Yes, this is a creative work which weighs against us, but remember that's just one factor and this is a balancing test. The third factor, remember, is how much are we using? One paragraph out of a 1200 page book is nothing. And finally, factor four, are we supplanting the market for the original? No one, that, no one is going to not buy Don Quixote because you've given them a one paragraph replacement out of a 1200 page book. So you are not supplanting the market for the original. So on balance factors one, three, and four are very strong and using this paragraph is fair use. Therefore, we do not need permission under step one and can skip to step three. So you can start to see in your dissertations that the more you really work with what you're using and just use what you need to, you sort of, the dissertations are sort of the best use case scenario for making fair uses um, and for not having to get permission. Okay, to recap step one, don't jump straight away to getting permission for things. First of all, the material might not be protected by copyright. It might, you might already have a license applied to it or your use might be a fair use. You have a right to make fair uses. You just need to use some judgment and apply some risk analysis when doing the four factor balancing test. The second step of the workflow is about how to actually obtain permission if you determine that permission is needed. You'll need to figure out who holds the copyright, send them a request, make sure that what you request covers all the things you need it to, and then keep records for your files. So I'm gonna to touch on each of these briefly. First of all, it's not always easy to figure out who owns copyright for a work. If you're talking about something like a journal article or book, you'll see a copyright symbol followed by the name of the entity, like a publisher or the person who holds copyright. You could just write to the author and see if they hold copyright, if there's information that's lacking on the material. Publishers and authors are really the folks to reach out to because even if they've later transferred their copyright to someone else, they'd be in the best position to identify that for you. But it may not be as easy as that. And that's because copyright transfers are not required by law to be registered anywhere. So for example, if you were to check copyright.gov, you'd only be able to find initial registrations and those subsequent transfers that people happen to have recorded. What's more, you don't have to register copyright with a copyright office in order to hold copyright. You only need to register it if you wanna be able to sue someone for infringement. So if you go to copyright.gov, you might not find any information on, on the copyright owner because they're not obligated to register their copyright to begin with. And also not to disparage it, but copyright.gov only has records from 1976 to the present. So it's sometimes necessary to check other sources besides the registrations on copyright.gov. Um, there's something called WATCH and FOB, that's writers, artists, and their copyright holders, which is a database of copyright contacts for writers, artists, and prominent figures in creative fields. And FOB is firms out of business, which is a database with information about vanished publishing agencies or literary agencies and similar firms. Now you might be inclined to contact the library or the archives where you found the material, but I have to be honest that in reality, libraries and archives hold very little or no information about the copyright ownership of the materials in their collections. The point of sharing all of this is that the process of finding rights holders and obtaining permission from them takes time. You might hit a few dead ends before you luck out. Plan in advance and be prepared not to hear back. This is why if there's a fair use argument to be made under step one, it's often a much better way to go. And we really want to remind you that uses of images, excerpts, and the like in dissertations are classic examples of fair use, so you might not need step two at all. One thing to keep in mind, though, if you do seek permission is to ensure that the permission you obtain covers the full scope of your needs. We have a sample permission request letter on our website that you can use as a model. What you're looking at here is something that happens a lot when you're dealing with professional artist rights management organizations. They give you their standard form or terms, which may limit the amount of time they're granting rights for. 
You wanna make sure that you negotiate for what you need with the understanding that your dissertation will be available online in perpetuity under UC Berkeley Graduate Division's policy. Finally, we recommend keeping track of your request efforts, especially if you're trying to clear rights for multiple or numerous items. We've got a sample spreadsheet on our website that you can use, but you don't need anything that formal. Just hang on to your emails and efforts. Keep in mind, you might not hear back after several attempts. The rights holder's silence is not their consent though. So if you don't hear back, you don't expressly have permission to move forward. However, your efforts at obtaining permission evidence your good faith and should you and, and should preclude the imposition of statutory damages if for some reason your use is ever challenged. I also wanna flag the situation when a rights holder does reply and their answer is no. How can you proceed? Well, just because they say no doesn't mean you can't move forward. Remember that you always have a fair use right. So even if you get a denial of your request, you can choose to still proceed under fair use if you can make a good fair use case. So that's why when people ask me, should I just email, why don't I just email the, the rights holder to begin with? Why bother making a fair use argument? And, and the answer is because they might just say no, when in reality, you already have a fair use right, um, depending on how you make use of the work. So just make sure you really transform the material under factor one so you have a very strong fair use argument. Okay, so to recap step two, try to make your use fair under step one so you can avoid step two. Um, step two takes time, so make a plan. If you can't locate a rights holder or you don't hear back, exercise judgment. And be prepared for your mileage to vary with publishers. Some publishers are extremely risk averse and will want an author to obtain permission, sometimes at great cost, even when the material either isn't protected by copyright or when the use is fair. So you can try educating them and pushing back, but often they won't budge from their standard risk averse policy and will require you to get permission even for uses that are fair or for materials that are otherwise in the public domain. So we build this workshop as being about copyright and your dissertation, but actually there are other non-copyright law and policy considerations that you should really take a look at as well. Um, we treat these in step three of the publishing workflow and essentially they boil down to contracts, privacy, and ethics. Next slide, please. We'll talk about what you need to know about contracts first. Um, and there are mainly three kinds of agreements you should know about. Uh, database licenses, website terms of use, and archives agreements. Next slide. So the first is databases. So let's say you're excerpting content from articles or images you downloaded from library databases, and you want to include those paragraphs or excerpts in your dissertation. Since you know a bit about copyright now, you know that this is likely to be fair use if you work with the paragraphs to provide new insights or analysis. There's a catch though. Database agreements that libraries sign can affect a researcher's ability to republish by restricting recirculation of the materials, even for uses that would otherwise constitute fair use. And if scholars are accessing material from library databases, our database agreement applies to them, even if the scholars didn't sign anything themselves. Making matters more challenging is the fact that researchers can have a difficult time finding out the terms of our database agreements. It's also typical that the agreement that the library signs is different from any public version that's viewable on the publisher's website. But the good news is that the UC signs database agreements that preserve fair use. So in many cases, if your dissertation is just excerpting some content from what you downloaded from our databases, you should be okay because we've signed agreements saying it's okay to make fair uses on that content. Where you might face issues though is if your research methodology involves text data mining. Those are trickier agreements with more complicated language, but you should know that we teach an entire session on navigating these issues within text data mining if you're interested. Uh, we also have a bunch of instructional videos online. But in any case, for the most part, our database agreement shouldn't be a problem for you to excerpt limited content 
for your dissertation. Next slide. Uh, however, if you're getting content from online sources outside of the library's databases, then there's a greater chance you're going to need to think about whether you can include portions in your dissertation under the website's terms of use. Again, this is separate from copyright. We already know your use might be fair, but, now there, but there's now a layer of contracts added on via the website's terms of use. And these terms could restrict the rights you otherwise would have under copyright law. Uh, here on the screen, we're looking at one of these from the Harry Ransom Center at UT Austin. This provision indicates that users must ask them for permission to reproduce images, even if doing so would constitute a fair use. So website terms of use are considered what are called browse wrap agreements. This means that users consent to them simply by browsing the website. Browse wrap agreements are not always enforceable by court. Contract issues are questions of state law rather than federal law. And courts in different jurisdictions may require that users have either actual or constructive notice of those terms. This type of notice means that a reasonable person should have been aware of the terms based on how the website was presented to them. And the courts will look to things like how visible the terms of service were, and whether the users were asked to consent to them. So what should you be aware of as a researcher? You should be aware that these terms may exist and you should weigh risk, uh, you should weigh risk to them accordingly. Often, if you are just accessing publicly available content, it could be potentially be a low risk to violate the terms because it may be hard for the content owner to prove damages. In other words, what did the website's owner suffer if it's publicly available content was used in a dissertation. Now, this doesn't mean that they won't try to sue. And also remember that we're just talking about contracts here. You could still be on the hook for copyright infringement if your use is not a fair use. Next slide. Finally, you may be asked to sign agreements with archives or museums that hold the collection of materials you're seeking to use. Here we see an archives agreement that requires library permission to use any materials from the archives, even if we know it would be fair use under copyright law to do so, and even if the library or archive is not the copyright holder to, to begin with. The researcher here is then required to contact the copyright holder and ask for permission, again, even if, if it would have been fair use to publish. So this puts researchers in a position of having to ask permission of the library and the copyright holder, when in both cases, it could be a fair use. This is really poor practice, but unfortunately that's how it works out for this case. But the good news is that these agreements with cultural heritage institutions are often more negotiable than with commercial vendors like database providers. Next slide. It's also important to understand certain things about privacy. Now, we have some great videos on what to know about privacy rights when you publish, but today we're just going to touch on a few of the key takeaways. Next slide, please. So whereas copyrights protect copyright holders' property rights in their works, privacy rights protect the interests of, interests of people who are the subjects of those works. Privacy rights arise most often if you're seeking to use third party primary source content like correspondence or diaries. Um, it also pops up around oral histories or images that contain information about particular people. And with privacy, there are a number of federal statutes that protect against the disclosure of various types of personal information. Uh, you might've heard of some of these, for example, FERPA, which covers student information and HIPAA, which covers health information. There are also state laws governing privacy. State privacy laws make certain intrusions a wrongful act. And there are four typical types of intrusions that state laws protect against. These are intrusion upon seclusion, public disclosure of private facts, painting someone in a false light, and appropriation of name or likeness. We're not, gonna go, we're not going to spend time today talking about what those are, 
Instead, we want to make sure you're aware of certain important limitations on privacy rights that could support your scholarship and publication. The first of these is that privacy rights expire at death, meaning you can't be liable for disclosing private facts about a person who is dead. Second, if the individual is not identifiable from the information or image that you're providing, there is no state law privacy violation. Third, if the material you want to include re reveals private facts that are newsworthy, then you might not be, then facts that are newsworthy, newsworthy, then you might be in the clear. Newsworthiness means it's of public interest or concern, which your dissertation scholarship may very well be. A final limitation is when the person who is the subject of the information has given you permission to publish, which you may have, have, have obtained. In this case, then an invasion of privacy claim should not be sustainable. We'll take a quick look at how this shakes out. So in this image, a news outlet is publishing text messages it received from an actress in which the actress was corresponding with the CEO of Warner Brothers. And the CEO of Warner Brothers was offering her movie roles in exchange for sex. As long as a news outlet obtained the text lawfully, that is from the actress, then it's perfectly fine for the news outlet to publish them because the scandal involving a public figure like the head of Warner Brothers is newsworthy and thus it fits into the privacy exception. Finally, the last consideration in step three is ethics. And that's definitely something we don't have much time to go into today although we do have videos available for you on this topic. Imagine for a moment your dissertation contains stories about vulnerable populations. And while newsworthiness may be an exception to privacy law, you may still face ethical considerations. We talk about a lot of different strategies and considerations for balancing harms in the videos that I mentioned. But all we really want to share today is that it's definitely advisable to discuss ethical concerns and the balancing of harm with your advisors and also consult standards and norms within your academic discipline. Next slide. So to wrap up step three, you should consider whether there are ethical, agree ethical agreements that may curtail uses that would otherwise be fair and try to negotiate for better terms if you can. Privacy law has important exceptions that could be useful in ensuring that you're able to include particular types of information within your research and dissertation. And finally, ethical considerations may require a balancing of harm, and you can, should consult with advisors and others in your field to determine these best practices. Okay, so we are almost there. Just one last step to think about as you ready your dissertation for submission and publication. And in this last step, there are two questions to ask yourself. First, since you're now an author and rights holder yourself, having written this dissertation, should you register your copyright? And two, do you want to add a license to the dissertation that would allow other people to make uses of it beyond fair use? So first question, you have copyright the moment your original expression is fixed in a tangible medium, like typed onto your computer screen. You don't need to do anything to own copyright, not anymore. You don't need to put a copyright symbol on it. You don't want to, and you don't need to register it with the US Copyright Office. But there are advantages of registering your copyright. It costs about $45, and what it buys you is the ability to sue people. You cannot file a suit for infringement unless you register your copyright. And infringement suits can be very lucrative. I'm thinking here for anyone who has a lot of student loans. And that's because there are statutorily prescribed damages that run anywhere between $750 and $30,000 per work at the discretion of a court. And plaintiffs who can show willful infringement may be entitled to damages of up to $150,000 per work. And those statutory damages only start to accrue after registration occurs. So if you wait to register, you could be missing out on some killer statutory damages. Lastly, recall that we talked a lot today about how you yourself rely on fair uses of other people's work. And they have a right to make fair use of your work. 
The question is, do you want to apply a license to the work beyond what would constitute fair use in order to make clear to others what you allow? You may have seen various Creative Commons licenses on scholarly materials that expressly authorize such uses and take the guesswork out of what others are allowed to do with your work. The answer is, with dissertations, you'll need to think about it and talk to your advisor. Many of you will be turning your dissertations into other papers or even a book, so you may not wish to apply a license on them beyond fair use. You have to think about your long-term goals for the work. So to wrap up step four, consider registration. And usually, no additional license to apply to your dissertation, but you can consider it, so talk to your advisor. Okay. That's it. We made it. Um, we're going to take all of your questions now. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen.